First of all, um, I would like to thank everybody who's come tonight from all directions. There are people here from all over, not just the UK, but all over the world. And without further ado, um, I would like to introduce Andy Sterling, co-director of the ESRC SEP Center at the University of Sussex. Well, thanks very much, Amber, and thanks to everyone involved in organizing this event, which does not include me. Uh, it, it's fantastic to see this group of people. I found the discussion already to be moving and inspiring, and I'm really looking forward to the onward uh, discussion we have here on the panel. Yeah, my, my role is simply to welcome people. It seems a bit invidious since we've already really engaged with these huge issues. Uh, but I just want to put it very briefly in context of what this, this particular meeting is part of from our point of view uh, at the STEP Centre. The STEP Centre is a bunch of academics who are part of a network internationally with partners in Buenos Aires and Nairobi and Delhi, Beijing. So we've got, we've got partners in different countries and what we're really struggling to get to grips with is how one goes about taking seriously the challenges of social justice and sustainability around the world in ways that are respectful to different ways of looking at those problems. And we're trying our best to engage with social movements in these different countries in a, obviously only a small way. Uh, but we're trying to do this because so much attention in academia and policy and business is on so-called transformation, so-called uh, radical change and innovation in a top-down way. And we're really interested in exploring ways in which that actually not only can be achieved, but actually really is achieved in the real world by the kinds of more horizontal organization that uh, we've heard about a bit already. So this event itself is part of a series of events that we're really privileged to have collaborated with a whole bunch of groups in the UK, transformation events we've been holding in various cities around the UK, talking about different aspects of transformation, how we take it seriously, how we achieve it. And this is one of those events, which I'm very excited to be able to attend today and then tomorrow when we have a workshop. And for me, this. I mean, I, I have found it really inspiring and moving because although the issues here are of incredible momentous importance in that particular area, which we want to uh, talk about more, also for the world as a whole, the challenge of achieving radical egalitarian transformation, ecological transformation in the way we've heard about, in ways that don't depend and rely and reinforce these vertical structures is something that's really interesting to us. So as one of the speakers said in the film, we're here to learn, and I've already learned a lot, and I'm really looking forward to learning more as the conversation proceeds. Thanks very much, everyone, for engaging with it. And next, I'd like to welcome Salima Tastamir, representative of the Sussex Kurdish community. Good evening, everyone. Um, distinguished guests, speakers, colleagues, and friends. Uh, thank you all for coming here and joining us uh, today. Uh, it's, great, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all, all on behalf of the Sussex Kurdish community and also a, a member of the organizing committee. Uh, we are delighted to have you here uh, to participate in this evening's uh, panel discussion on the revolution in Rojava uh, and beyond perspectives on democratic transformations with two distinguished key speakers, Janet Beal and Arjan Aiba. I would like to take this opportunity to express my sincere thanks uh, to our both key speakers as well as the participants and speakers of the tomorrow uh, workshop which will focus on the emancipatory transformations, engaging radical democracy in Kurdistan. We appreciate each of, this, uh, uh, each of them for taking the day time and effort to be here to share their ideas, opinions, experience, knowledge, and expertise. To my, my, to my knowledge, this is the first event that addressed the Rojava uh, revolution and democratic transformation in Rojava in a such broad context in Brighton. We are very proud to be part of the, this event, uh, today's event, and jointly organized by STEP Center, Sussex Kurdish Community, and Brighton Kurdistan Solidarity. Uh, I, I especially would like to thank to uh, STEP Center 
Amber Hoof and Patrick Hoof for uh, approaching us with the idea of holding such an uh, event in a critical time when Kurdish people and Kurdish women in particular have been taking the air fight, struggle, resistance against the most brutal uh, anti-human and barbaric terrorist groups, uh, dictatorships, and so-called elected governments in their divided homeland, Kurdistan. Uh, in this respect, I believe this event is very important for providing an opportunity to bring the large number of academics, researchers, and activists to discuss the project of democratic reconstruction in Rojava that offers possibility for, transform, for transformative peace, freedom, democracy, and democracy, uh, not only in Syria and in the region. Uh, I also would like to acknowledge my uh, uh, colleagues and organizing committee members, namely uh, for their effort uh, at this event, namely Amber Hoof, Amber Hoof, uh, Patrick Hoof, and Kamran Metin, uh, Mehmet Ur, and Jamal Özkahraman, uh, and Step Center staff for their hard work and dedication for the uh, workshop preparation. I also would like to take this opportunity uh, to inform you briefly about uh, our association and community. Uh, Sussex Kurdish Community is a registered charity established in 2010 by a uh, group of Kurdish residents as a result of uh, a large number of Kurdish people living and working in the Sussex. And to enable them to address their problems and promote their social, economic, uh, cultural, and, uh, demo and the, their democratic rights in Sussex region. Although our members are predominantly coming from the northern Kurdistan, uh, the developments in other parts of Kurdistan, uh, in every sense, affect our members deeply. Uh, especially since the uh, Syrian conflict start, the smallest parts of the Kurdistan, Rojava, has become a center of attention for us. Uh, with its uh, historic resistance against IS or ISIS and uh, and uh, uh, the revolutionary democratic system which being established despite the war. Uh, thus, this, uh, discussing the uh, inspiring case of the Rojava on a such platform is very significant for us uh, as it enables to introduce the uh, Rojava revolution and democratic system in Rojava uh, a wider audience. I certainly hope that uh, this event will be, the, uh, will be that uh, what you expect it to be and that you take this opportunity to have a, a discussion and exchange of your visions, experiences, uh, knowledge, opinions regarding the Rojava revolution and the wider Kurd uh, Kurdish democratic movement uh, with uh, uh, with academics uh, and uh, researchers and uh, activists coming from different places and to meet new colleagues uh, in the field of the uh, Kurdish studies. Thank you for your attention. Let's speak from there. Are you going to speak from there? Yeah. Okay. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, it's great to see so many so, so see so many of you here tonight. Uh, my name is Kamran Matin. I teach uh, at the University of Sussex, uh, and I have had the privilege and pleasure of being involved in organizing this this uh, splendid program. As we all know, uh, certain movements at certain times uh, assume a significance well beyond their geographical uh, boundaries and their own time. And I think Rojava and the wider Kurdish freedom movement is an example of such a movement. Um, and I think um, we all noticed 
this um, self-consciousness of being part of much wider movement of a universal and humanistic struggle for egalitarianism and equality from the people whom you saw in the film talking about their vision for the future, the struggle they are engaged in, and so on. So we uh, envisage this program as an opportunity for us to share ideas about Rojava movement, the ideals it represents, the achievement it has produced, and the limitations and problems it encounters. Uh, and we want to use today's uh, event and tomorrow's workshop to reflect critically on this experience up to this point in its evolution and learn from each other's um, experience and knowledge on Rojava. And hopefully some of this comes through today in the panel and in the films which we have already seen. So thanks for being here. <laughs>Thank you all for coming. It's wonderful to see such a great turnout. And I'm really, I'm hoping that you will take what you've learned today and think about ways to translate it into action to help support the project, the remarkable project that is Rojava. I have several connections with this project. Um, most recently, uh, I'm the translator of a book uh, that was written by a delegation that, that visited Rojava for a month in May 2014. Um, they wrote it in German. And I, should be, I need to be careful to say that I didn't translate it from Turkish, from German, and it's been published by Pluto Press. So part of what I'm doing here this week is doing book, book launches for this wonderful and extremely informative book. Um, another way I'm connected with Rojava is that I've been there twice myself. Um, I've written as part of delegations to observe and witness. Um, I've, written about, I've written about it in several places online, and you can find my, work, my observations about it there. But my third connection is, is somewhat of a different order. It has to do with ideology, and that is my, my collaboration with this Murray Bookchin that some of you have heard about or may know about already. Um, his ideas of social ecology were um, a great influence on the development of democratic confederalism, which is the, the basic ideological structure on which Rojava is based. Um, so let me tell you, I thought I would tell you a little bit about how this how this route uh, actually dates back long before I knew Bookchin to the 1950s to the Bronx in the United States in New York in the era after World War II. Bookchin had been um, a communist, a member of the Stalinist movement, as he later called it, um, uh, in the 30s, trying to create a proletarian revolution to overthrow capitalism, but was disappointed that that did not work out in, during World War II. Many of his comrades decided upon the failure of the proletariat to make a revolution to move to the right and to enter mainstream society and have a good life for themselves. But Bookchin couldn't do that because he considered capitalism to be a form of barbarism and to accept capitalism is to accept barbarism and that could not and that was intolerable. So he worked with a group of people um, to think out what were the new limits of capitalism. There has to be a limit because capitalism is an evil system. And if the limit is not the, the misery of the proletariat or the falling rate of, uh, pro well, the different Marxist terms, I'm sorry, they're not on the tip of my tongue right now, um, <laughs> then, then, what are, then what are the limits of capitalism? Um, he looked around and he saw many things about post-war American society. He saw that the American government had become very centralized and very powerful, partly as a result of the war. He saw that the economy was tur being turbocharged with capitalism, that giant enter enterprises were becoming larger and larger and swallowing up small, small uh, enterprises. He saw that um, technology was turning people into, into robots, th that, that instead of being the masters of technology, people were being, being you're almost reduced to arms of machines. And above all, he saw that agriculture was becoming industrialized. It was becoming, it was being reworked for the purposes of profit for, as part of the capitalist system. And in, or in the process of that, uh, small-scale farming had given way to large industrialized tracts that uh, above all relied on chemicals for all sorts of reasons for, for you know, pesticides and food and preservatives and, and herbicides. And these were toxic to health. Now the evil twin 
as I like to think of it, of the industrialized agriculture system that he was criticizing is the megalopolis, the giant city. Cities, too, in parallel with this, the, the, the gigantic agriculture were themselves becoming gigantic. They were being choked with cars. They were being crowded with people. They were spewing out pollution of both the air and the waterways. They were, they were um, uh, and, re and again, reducing people to, to automatons who went into routine jobs in their daily life and stripping them of of their power, their potential power as political beings. It was, the, 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 the megalopolis was rendering them pass, passive, and the state is the, epitomizes the, 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 the political dimension of this process. Um, so, in, uh, and so in all these ways, he developed a program for decentralization. He wanted to decentralize agriculture, he wanted to decentralize the cities and marry them in a vision of town and country that are united on a, on a small scale so that food is produced near where it's consumed. He wanted to, to, re, to decentralize technology because he's new, he wasn't a primitivist, but these new technologies of miniaturization and cybernation and even computers were coming in and he thought that these could lend themselves to a small scale manufacturing rather than these gigantic industrial facilities that were coming up. He, needed, he thought energy needed to be decentralized because look what was coming in, nuclear power for, which, and, and, and fossil fuels which were, put, which were contributing to, these, to this um, large scale, the large scale of industry and the cities. Um, and so he thought that, and, and, and uh, let's see, technology, uh, so the economy had to be decentralized as well. He had some ideas about that that he later called the municipalization of the economy. But above all, the most important piece for what we're describing here, I think, is the political decentralization. He, he thought that there, we needed to be institution, that, that it wasn't enough to destroy the state as anarchists were, were calling for. There needed to be institutions that could embody freedom, that could create freedom, that could, because if you just have a free-for-all, then somebody is gonna fight and become dominant and will end up with a dictatorship again. So freedom, he said, has its forms. It has to be, you have to have institutions that, that guarantee equality and, with people and that guarantee that everyone has rights. And um, this, and this would, uh, he looked to ancient Athens, he looked throughout history and found different, different models. Um, <laughs> for, for place, rare, rare places <coughs> in history where this had been uh, uh, embodied, uh, ancient Athens, um, the New England town meeting, um, tribal societies, um, the, there were some assemblies in the, in, the Parisian, in the French Revolution in the 1790s that he was very interested in. Um, but they all had, were, uh, had a, were besmirched in some ways by history, it was you know it was very easy for people to laugh and say, oh oh, face to face democracy, you know, citizens assemblies, those things can never work, you know. Why look at ancient Athens? It was built on slavery and ex excluded women, and it was imperialist. I mean, look at those New England town meetings they, in 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 the United in, in the early America. Um, they were they were, were involved with war, waging wars against Indians, and plus they were religious fanatics. And as for the French Revolution, there was a lot of blood involved, so. But what Bookchin said was essentially, look, all those things, all those, all those, uh, that, uh, the, the defects, historical defects, are not inherent to the institutions themselves, to that idea of a citizen's assembly. Instead of looking for reasons not to do it, not to create them, because, oh, women might be excluded, let's start with the idea that we're going to, that this is the ethical, that this is a way to make politics ethical, to include everyone to include everyone so that everyone can make decisions together about their own community life. Let's start with the premise that it's ethical and then work out the problems from there instead of excluding it from the, from the, from the outset. Another objection that was often raised though was, well, we have a very complex society. You know, we have, um, the, this, the ancient Athens was very, very small scale. Um, Paris, you know, that, yeah, that was a big city in the 1790s, but still, you know, much smaller than cities today. Um, well, he had an, his answer to this problem was confederation, that it, the citizens' assemblies that would be created as the vested in citizen empowered government of localities, self government, would work together in confederation. And he took the idea. He took the structure from the anarchists of the CNT and the Spanish Revolution and other parts of anarchist history. Um, there's a, a, a series, they worked in a series of tiers 
so that power could flow from the bottom up, um, so that so that the delegates would be mandated from from the base level of the assemblies up to a coordinating council, and maybe up to another one, and up to another one, so that these so that decisions could be made as and uh, administration could happen over broad areas, and yet power would flow from the bottom up. That was the all important thing because he was an anarchist by this time. He was, and this the reason for um, the, uh, the uh, he thought that he thought that this state was reducing people to passive non-entities. He wanted people to be active citizens. He wanted them to take charge of their own lives. And 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 look, also it's you know. He was, the, the, this human health issue continued to be very important because pollution uh, was wrecking the environment and making the biosphere impossible for people to live in. So, so those two things for him went together. So um, these ideas became known as, as eco, were called by different names. Um, if you don't mind me laying on some ideology here to you, eco-anarchism, social ecology, um, communalism, Libertarian municipalism is the specific name for this, this um, idea of the political dimension of the, of the communes and councils in confederation. And he wanted, he thought that this could become, become um, a, a counterpower to the, to the nation state. If that, that the people would, would, would see that they can govern their own lives, they could make decisions that, and, that, that could, could turn society around so it wasn't destroying the biosphere. And they would, they would when enough people participated in the citizens' assemblies and in the confederations, it would form a dual power to the nation state and could be overthrown. Before I go on, I just want to say a little bit about this economic decentralization. For me, that's the heart of um, his, his, his uh, study of early society, uh, what he called organic society, where people lived in, 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 in tribal society um, operating uh, what, according to what Marx called primitive communism, but he, Bookchin used different words, which I think are very useful. Usufruct, production for use, you work the, 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 using things just as you need them, and, but sharing the rest. The ethic of complementarity, where people of different abilities take care of each other and look, look out for each other. Um, uh, the irreducible minimum, I love this concept. It almost sounds like the guaranteed basic income, right? I mean, the irreducible minimum means everybody is taken care of. It means, and above all, it means the community takes care of everybody. That social security lies in community, not in each individual person going out and fighting for his, fighting for him or herself, and you know, perpetuating the profit system. Well, um, he sp he spent decades trying to advocate these ideas, and while he did develop some some. Um, uh, com comrades along these lines. Um, I joined him in 1987, um, a, 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 a large movement to, to uh, undertake this was, didn't, didn't materialize. Um, I'll, I'll just point out one, if you want to know more about libertarian municipalism and this, this political project, um, at his behest I wrote this little book called The Politics of Social Ecology, colon, Libertarian Municipalism in 1997 or 98, something like that. It's published by Black Rose Books, and it's been translated into several languages. Um, but um, it's a, it's a, it's, we decided at one point that we needed a primer. So uh, as I said, it, it didn't really take off in the United States, but as, has been, as we've all come to, to realize now, it, a Turkish translation became very important, several Turkish translations. They were read by Abdullah Öcalan in Imrali prison um, around, I think, around two, between 2000, 2002, or three. I think especially this book on urbanism, this, these political ideas were very important to him, libertarian municipalism. Um, by 2002, he was recommending them to his, to his, uh, to the Havals, to the, to the friends in the, in the PKK. And it's, at this time, the PKK was undergoing an, an ideological transformation away from the demand for a separate Kurdish state, which has been part of its founding manifesto in 1978, a separate Kurdish state created along sort of Marxist, or worked for along Marxist-Leninist lines. Instead, they would give up the idea of a state and try to create this bottom-up polity with councils and confeder in confederation, communes and councils in confederation. Um, I don't want to, this was certainly not the, uh, Bookchin's influence was certainly not the only one. Um, he read, uh, many books on democracy, I'm sure, in prison, um, and there's also, you know, you can look at ancient Athens for uh, uh, ancient models of assembly democracy, but they also existed in Mesopotamia. So, but he did put it together, and Bookchin did have some importance. In fact, when he, 
uh, some inter intermediaries wrote to him. I, we were living together at the time. Um, uh, on one morning on my inbox, I see um, some uh, a request for a dialogue, and at some point during during that sort of mediated conversation, um, um, Ergelin said through translators and lawyers and two books that he was a social he considered himself a social ecologist and a very good student <coughs> of Bookchin. So we know that there was there was some um, some influence. In any case, um, after after um, Bookchin died. In 2006, the, the a PKK assembly swore that they would be the first society to, the first place to create a Bookchin polity on, on the planet. And um, it turned out that they, as, as I think Erjan will go into in a little more detail, um, they, these, um, it was, it, an effort was, a, a conscientious effort had been made to think out the best ideology and then to implement it, to put it in practice. You know, they weren't, they, weren't just, they weren't just tinkering. They discussed it first and then decided that democratic confederalism is the best approach for all sorts of reasons and would put it into practice. Just before, one more thing before I, before I have to give up my, my, my microphone here. Um, I've, I, find, I have found that in my, in my um, travels to Rojava and in reading about all this, it's very, a, a good way to approach understanding the phenomenon is through this basic rejection of the state, the state in all its forms. In the Middle East, it's uh, for, for the heterogeneous peoples that, that live there, for that, het, that incredibly polyglot area, um, the state has been a, a force for repression, for um, um, denial of identity, and, and ultimately also for massacres and even genocide. So this, there's a, this, this unitary state that insists in Turkey that insists that everyone that lives in Turkey is a Turk and everyone that lives in Syria is an Arab. Um, this this over overrides ethnicity, uh, ethnic and religious differences. When I was in Rojava, I met a woman called Nulifer Koch who said, you know, it's, it's ethnic, ethnic warfare and religious warfare. These are, these divi are divisions created by the state. If there wasn't the state pitting people against each other, we could all live together in peace. And I think that's what that's um, and that's one of the one of the basic principles of the Kurdish of the Kurdish movement. It's embodied in their in their constitution. So you see in Rojava a transfer of basic uh, f the, the the organizing functions of the state into society, into a stateless society. So instead of a constitution, which they associate with a state, they have a social contract or a charter. And it contains, it's not just a change in language, it's, 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 it's full of all sorts of um, human rights affirmations and affirmations of the, on the liberation of women and on ethnicities. It doesn't even use the word Rojava, as Erjan has pointed out, because that's a Kurdish word. Um, it's a, it, it, everyone seems to be included. Um, uh, other ways, um, they, instead of, they don't have police because police serve the state. They have asaish, def egalitarian defense forces that defend the society. They don't have an army. It's, you know, that's, it, that's associated with the state. They have the YPG and the YPJ, the people's protection units. You can see just from that language that it's about supporting, the, 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 these units are, militias are to support the society and not the state. Um, there's a transfer of land. I think, as someone mentioned earlier, um, a lot of land was left behind after the Syrian regime uh, left, and it's been turned not into not into um, corporate enterprises bolstered by a state, but, but into cooperatives embodying, um, into especially agrarian cooperatives, cooperatives embodying these principles that that I think you know uh, you could also call you could call them the irreducible minimum. The ethic of complementarity and usufruct. They're, they're they're, these are principles by which people work together in, and make decisions and organize a cooperative in an egalitarian way and look after each other. Um, the education system is 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 not the. They don't use the. When I was there, they didn't use the word university because they associate university with the state. Instead, they have academies, which are institutions for popular education, not just for students between a certain age, but for students of all ages, up to even people who are in their 80s and 90s, go to, go to the, um, the academies for popular education. And everyone, there's no unidirectional flow of education from teacher to student. It's a mutual process of mutual discussion. I think that's one reason they're so committed to, to their ideas is because they've discussed them and discussed all the possibilities so thoroughly until they, until they, there's this, they, everyone, until an agreement is reached that this is the, the, the way to go forward. Um, what else, what else? Oh, I had some other, some other ways I wanted to mention of, in which functions are transferred from the state to society, but I think, 
I'm running out of steam now. So I'm going to turn <laughs> it over to, to Air John, and, if, and we can talk about it more during the question period. So. Good evening to all. Eva Arvash. I'm really happy to speak to here, very pleased, and I can even say it's a honor for me to speak uh, about the revolution in Rojava uh, and the situation in and around, and try to explain. Um, I have prepared a presentation. I will go a little in the history, not really, but to give some basics. Uh, you see a map which shows areas of Kurdish minor, uh, majority. Uh, here we have the Syrian state. You see it's a, a state where the smallest number of people live, and which, which is the smallest geography, and they live along the bo Turkish border, more or less. There are different maps, and I just choose one, and each map shows the areas a little different. Um, the Kurds, they make around 15% of the population in Syria, around. And today they, or let's say in 2011, the number was around 3 million of totally 22, 23 million. Um, the Kurds, they are one of the many cultural groups. Syria is a very culturally diverse country, a state, let's say state. And you see the different colors, each is for, for, for another one. And the dark, the green one in the north, uh, they show the Kurds. This, is, this map differs from the other one. Um, the Kurds, uh, they speak all one dialect. It's Kurmanji, it's important, so, uh, because we have five in total. Uh, more or less, and um, they ha are all, not all, almost all, I guess 95% are Sunni Muslims. If the other percent are Ezidi people or Alevis, Alevis live in the northwest, the Ezidis in the northeast. Um, the Kurds are, uh, differs, I try to give, differs from the Kurds in other parts where the state has not promoted the religion so much, the Muslim religion. So they are conservative on one side, but they are not so strong religious. The Kurds in, in Syria, they have been faced in the 60s with a so-called Arab belt and Arabization. It's important because in this period, the Syrian state settled many Arabs, especially to the northeast area or along the north, uh, Turkish border. To change the uh, demography of the region in a certain way. Um, 150,000 Kurds have, they have lost their citizenship from the uh, Syrian state. The number rose later to 350,000 uh, because they claimed they, that they came from Turkey in the 20s. This is something special. They had absolutely no rights. Uh, second class people. Yes, and the Kurds start in Syria, in Rojava, they started to uh, form, of course, parties, and some people, of course, were politically active, but usually they concentrated on South Kurdistan and North Kurdistan. In the 60s, they started to join the armed struggle in South Kurdistan, and at that time, the uh, Kurdistan Democratic Party of Syria, PDKS, became the strongest party. Then, in the... 80s, it changed this political uh, situation among the Kurds. Uh, in, in the year 1980, uh, Abdul Ajalan and many PKK members came to Syria and uh, where they prepared the armed struggle in North Kurdistan. They started to organize a lot of uh, Kurds in, the, in Rojava and in Aleppo, especially in the north, in the Afrin region and in the a Kobani region. Maybe one back. The Afrin, Afrin region is more or less is this area. Here is Kobani. This is this region. And here is the region Jazeera. So three main G, uh, regions. Uh, through the uh, Arabization, one information, uh, the population demography changed so much that the Kurds are only here in the majority and here. And here are our small areas. And here, mostly, but not everywhere, it's quite very complicated. There are Arabs, there are Syriacs, 
which come from the Assyrians, uh, Armenians, Chaldeans, Cherkessians, Turkmenes, and so on. Um, this is the diversity is more than in the other parts of Kurdistan. This is also to mention. Okay, let's continue. So PKK became in the 90s always more stronger among the Kurds in Rojava. Um, in that, in 98, Abdul Ajal had to leave Syria, as some of you know, or the most. And in 99, he has been kidnapped to Turkey. And this was a point, moment where the Syrian state increased the repression on the Kurds. And the, the top peak of the suppression was a massacre in Kamishlo in 2004, when around 30 people have been killed after a football match. Um, you must consider that the uh, Syrian state was based on the Arab nationalism, the past Ba'ath Party is living there, and uh, they used uh, some Arabic groups or other groups uh, to attack the Kurds in this year. In the following years, the repression was very high and the Syrian state had very good relations with Turkey. And in this period, we came to the year 2011. Uh, this should also mention that Rojava is the poorest or was the poorest region of Syria. The Kurds were the poorest parts of the population. Of course, there were other par poor parts, but uh, there were absolutely no big investments. The state did everything that the economy doesn't develop so much. That's why many moved to Aleppo and other big cities. So then came the year 2011, the so-called Arab Springs, the up uprisings in North Africa. And this, in this moment, um, the Kurds, they, they, they were very careful. In many Kurdish cities, people, the Kurds started to protest also, maybe not in a very big number, but especially the young, younger generation. And they did demonstrations, but uh, they didn't end in violence or in massacres like in the other parts. This is related that they are careful because they faced extreme repression and because they didn't arm themselves. And in this moment, in March 2011, uh, PYD, the Democratic Party Union, which has been created, uh, founded in 2003, and represents the Kurdish freedom movement in Rojava. I mean, Kurdish freedom movement, the leftist one, the left one, and they decided do not uh, to say, okay, we organize a society. So what we do, this is the moment, there is coming a war, uh, a conflict and war, and different powers of the region and world will intervene. And they had, unfortunately, they had right, and we, we must organize ourselves, organize in the, in the neighborhoods, villages, and everywhere how we can. And uh, they did it, and um, some people compared with the, uh, with the Zapatistas who do not aim to confront militarily so much, more to concentrate on self-organizing, empowering. So in the summer 2011, then the ways divided, uh, and the Kurds, one block was formed by PYD and several other organiza Kurdish organizations, like from the West, the People's Councils of West Kurdistan, and which is also called Tevdem, the Democratic Movement for the Movement for a Democratic Society. The other side was uh, ENKS, uh, Kurdish National Council of Kurds, no, Kurdish National Council in Syria, ENKS, more let's say liberal right block, uh, right parties, and the center is the PDK. So, um, and the have them especially didn't join the main op uh, opposition group in Syria, which was formed, is formed by the Syrian National Council, which has been founded also in the summer 2011. Then the ways divided. And August, uh, the MGRK, the People's Council of West Kurdistan, has been founded. Um, I would like to read some sentence from the book to uh, there are quotations from activists from that time. They describe it like this. It's a time 
before, before the start of the revolution in July 2012. In the spring of 2011, we expected that the protest movement would spread, Silvan Afrin told us. We talked about how to get ready for it and what we would do. We were very watchful. That spring, we began to build people's organizations. The question arose as to how we would protect ourselves. So in July or August, we established the YXG, the pro predecessor of YPG, the self-protection unit. At first, we were few in number, as most people were still so intimidated by the state. We invited all the minorities to, founding, to a founding congress, but because the war was going on, only a handful had the courage to show up. The only party that supported us was the PYD. We were always criticized for that, but the PYD had worked every day at the grassroots and, and our numbers grow. We built the armed units illicitly. Many people in Kurdistan had weapons hidden away, shotguns, pistols, kalashnikovs. Within six or seven months, we organized the self-defense committees of the YXG clandestine, clandestinely. Next paragraph. The first to join, Heval Amer told, Heval Amer told us, were young people from the streets with no political views. As soon as the first martyrs fell, more people joined. Almost every family already had members who were martyrs, meaning PKK guerrillas. At first, our work was very dangerous. Regime agents were everywhere, all around us. In all of Derek, there was only one friend, means activist Heval. But gradually, we visited all the families of martyrs, martyrs and prisoners, and everyone was ready to do something. The state left us in peace, and we established a, very, a few strong points. So we had many uh, conversations like this, um, uh, because uh, there are a lot of allegations and claims that the state just uh, that there was a meeting uh, agreement between PYD and the state, and uh, the PYD get the area from the uh, space from the area, which was not so true. But the state had not the strong interest to attack the Kurds in this moment, as it was concentrating on the other uh, rebel groups or oppositional groups in Syria. So uh, we see here a lot of things, and then the. The uh, MGRK has been founded. Uh, I don't want to make a long theoretical background, but you see, um, I want to only mention it, what were the basis? Uh, democratic confederacy was a political approach developed by PKK, uh, especially by Abdullah Öcalan. In 2005, it has been declared. It just says, uh, its idea is, and here it here refers especially to Murray Bookshin, he says that I, we must find a structure which includes, involves uh, all parts of the society, is open to them, not a class, and uh, as much as possible people should join uh, the, the decision-making processes in our society, should be the actors. In this sense, uh, the Different cultural groups, means ethnic and religious groups, were important. And uh, from this approach, the rejection of the nation state became very open. And uh, the, the, term, the term democratic nation has been developed in this uh, context. Um, the decision making should be done according to, a radic to direct democracy. We call it radical democracy. It means uh, not what we have in the most Western states or the most part of the world, a parliamentary and representative system. We must do it more democratic. More, uh, we must go more to the ground. The broader population must be the actors. Um, then the women liberation is a very crucial element. Uh, it's, it forms actually every sphere. And in the 
movies, documentary, it was said enough. But the ecology, I am personally in the uh, Mesopotamian ecology movement active, which is based in North Kurdistan. For us, it is very crucial and the ecological dimension means not only the conservation of nature and ecosystems and biodiversity, it's more it's about the way how we live, how we produce, consume, and how we distribute and move and so on. And this leads us, if we continue in the logic to an uh, anti-capitalist approach. Um, in, yes, this were more or less uh, the basis, and uh, short, we can say, empowering people. The, we benefited uh, lots, or the people in Rojava benefited from the uh, experience of uh, Bakur, North Kurdistan at that time, because since 2007, the, the Democratic Society Congress has been founded. There were also neighborhoods and structures and upper structures, social movements and so on, NGOs, etc. And the municipalities ruled by the Kurdish Freedom Movement. And there, in North Kurdistan, come all the actors in the Democratic Society Congress together. Uh, North Kurdistan has different, very different conditions because we have a state, a strong, a repressive state a very neoliberal state, the capitalism is growing very fast, there are a lot of investments, Turkey, uh, be Turkish state belongs to one of the states in the world where um, you can ma make a lot of uh, profit with investments. So this affected also Kurdistan, of course, the capitalism came stronger to North Kurdistan, and our movement wanted to establish something alternatively, very far from uh, uh, capitalism, uh, solidarity society, so the two extremes they, they, uh, existed and exist in North Kurdistan. And it, it's much more difficult to establish, develop, deepen there uh, because of capitalism and repression. You know, between 2009 and 12, almost 10,000 activists had been uh, arrested. So, you now, uh, many friends are arrested again. Late, um, yes, um, I have a, let's say, uh, we come to uh, show now you some pictures from the liberation uh, in Kobani, and the Kobani started. There are two pictures, they're not very good many pictures from that time. You see these two pictures, here's the popular uprising. And here you see how they, uh, there's a flag, Kurdish flag, on the building, which is one of the governmental buildings in Kobani. So this has been done by popular uprising. I want to mention it uh, because we say it is a revolution. It is not only uprising or liberation. It is a liberation which started in Kobani that makes Kobani uh, important. And after the resistance against uh, Islamic State in 2014, it makes it double important for us. It's a city of resistance. So, um, and continuing. Yes, um, um, the, the moment of this liberation is also important to only recover. Just one, two days ago, the big attack of FSA and other jihadist groups started in Damascus and Aleppo and other cities. And uh, the Sur Syrian state shaked a lot. And uh, just in this moment, uh, Tevdem, the, the upper structure for the councils and, the, and YPG decided uh, to liberate the cities. And uh, the liberation of Kobani started like this. It was a decision which was taken in one day. Okay, we do it tomorrow, like this. And there was also, uh, the Syrian state was in a very weak situation to use it, to take advantage of it. And there was a risk that if we don't do it, uh, the FSA or other Islamists will come and take our lands. So this liberation continued the next days and weeks, and slowly, slowly they liberated the area. Sometimes there were small clashes, but not big, because the Syrian state, they had uh, retreated already a lot of police and military from the towns. So um, 
Uh, the biggest threat after the start of the revolution uh, came from the Turkish states and the jihadists in Islam, uh, and some FSA units. Um, jihadists, FSA, some FSA, they worked closely together with the Turkish state, which, is, which, which worked, uh, had a strategy together with Saudi Arabia and Qatar, and which was supported by the NATO states. So the Turkish state, but the uh, Turkish state's approach was important that the jihadists started to attack uh, Rojava. It didn't start it with Islamic State in 2014. So the Turks, but the Turkish state has a double strategy. On one side, uh, it forced, uh, encouraged jihadists or F parts of SFA, FSA to attack Rojava which started in November 2012. On the other side, there were meetings. Uh, the Turkish government didn't say yet PYD is a terrorist organization or YPG. Sometimes they say, used in the, said it indirectly. Um, sometimes there were still uh, meetings. You remember the PYD co-leader, co-chair Salih Muslim has been invited twice to Turkey. So Turkey tried to make pressure uh, on Tevdem to join uh, the Syrian National Council and to make pressure on YPG and to join FSA. But they re uh, rejected because uh, the so-called main opposition of Syria, they didn't accept really the uh, uh, rights of Kurds, I mean culturally accepting the identity on the same level, autonomy, decentralized state, like like the state that was not really never accepted. Um, so this was the time, and that time we started, I was in Germany, and we uh, discussed, okay, uh, we, what's going on? We tried to read everything what we could, but it was not enough, and in the, internationally it was not really discussed, and even many Kurds in Europe or in, in North Kurdistan didn't really understood or didn't take it very serious what's going on there and they didn't really, were not uh, convinced that there's a revolution. So in this time we said, okay, we must send a delegation who should stay there and uh, make as much investigation, research, interviews as possible. So we three people went to there in May 2014. We did 120 interviews. Uh, we could go everywhere, and because we three, we are also part of this broader Kurdish freedom movement. We had better access than many journalists or, let's say, other activists which were not so much connected. And uh, yes, we could had a very interesting insight, and the result was a book. Uh, was this book first in German, then in English, but. After the translation, we did also a lot of updates in English. And um, I must say that Janet didn't only translate it, she also edited the book, and we, I have to end, mention it and make proposals how to move parts from here to there. And in that time, the English uh, translation was important because uh, the English translation was the basis also to translate it in further other languages. Now the book has been translated also in Italian, very soon in Spanish, Russian, and Greek. And very hopefully in two, three, four months in Turkish and in Arabic. So totally eight languages. Um, yes, um, back to Rojava. We stated that there is a big process. There's a, a lot of things are done, undergoing. There are a lot of discussion, interesting discussions. Uh, we have seen a lot of cooperatives, uh, uh, communes at that time. You know, when the revolution started, there were communes. Communes mean the smallest organization unit existed in the villages, but not in the cities. In cities, we had the neighborhood councils, which include the neighborhoods where live usually several thousand, ten, twenty thousand people. Uh, in 2014, I met, we met a lot of people who worked in these communes. They said we must break down the lowest self-organization structure and we must go to the residential streets to include more people in the organization 
and to involve, give a task to everybody and empower people. Of course, PYD did it, does it and have them activists. They go to the people and say, we should do this. Others have done it. You should, could also do it. And they encourage people to organize themselves on the lowest level. I mention this because in 2011, there was no big uh, request in the Kurdish society of Rojava that we now organize ourselves in direct radical democracy. Only PYD discussed it. They discussed it. There were, but there were 2,000 people maybe in total even less, who really discussed this issue. So it's a process. This is important. So now look to 2011 and today. Today we will see a lot of people on the ground which have started the idea of self-organizing on the lowest level. Um, yes, um, then this structure developed in uh, 2013 and summer there was a new big attack um, by, here's a picture of uh, where in a neighborhood, the coordinations of some communes came together. We joined it. It's in the city of Derik. Um, yes, and then in 2013 summer, there was a big attack by Islamic State, Al-Nusra, and some FSA groups on Rojava. It was a big one, and it was defeated after one, two months. Uh, just directly after that, a new discussion started, by, initiated by Tevdem. Tevdem is a movement for a democratic society. Uh, the coordination of the People's Council of West Kurdistan, which is, which is MGRK. Um, I mentioned the two names because they are used here and there, and it's always not really understand what is what. Uh, even we didn't really understand it until we went to Rojava. Um, the new process started, have them, which it was not only uh, supported by P PYD as party, meanwhile four or five other par Kurdish parties and the important part of the Chaldeans in Rojava. They started and uh, the discussion with 50 organizations, including parties, uh, for a new, uh, more comprehensive umbrella uh, political structure for Rojava. And um, they started, and of course you needed this social contract, which Janet mentioned it. It was prepared over four months. There were a lot of discussions in the society. There's a difference between the first draft and the last one. Last one. I could compare it. And um, January 2014, it has been approved, to, approved and accepted completely with a declaration of democratic autonomy as a political model and the democratic autonomous uh, administrations have been uh, created. Um, you see here a diagram, um, don't look too much on it before I must uh, explain two things. This new structure was, a, uh, let's say, more a kind of what we know or with a parliament, legislative council, with the government, uh, and the basis of the municipalities on the communal level, and which should be the upper structure. There were, a, including all these uh, different organizations which were represented in this common parliament of each canton. Now the three regions became the name canton. And uh, yes, with each had 22 ministries and so on. And, uh, but there were two main reasons why this has been done. Uh, first, to include more, involve more part of the population of Rojava, to have them was representing maybe a little more than 50% or 60%, something like this. But still many Kurds, especially the Syriacs or Arabs, were not part of it. They said there was a need to include more. Okay. Uh, of course, have them could continue to exist and try to include more, but there was a need, an urgent need. There's war, embargo, and always attacks. 
And this was the second reason, uh, seek for uh, legitimation on Syrian international level and for a status. And status means involving in the negotiations, the Geneva talks. Um, yes, and this summarizes, this is also in the book, shortly the structures. On the basis we, we have the communes here. Um, it starts from here. It's a typical, more or less typical uh, council democracy, more or less. And they have a coordination, um, co-chair, men and women, of course, and different uh, commissions, uh, com commissions, yes, and the commissions are here. Basically eight, which include all the society. The health is a little excluded, but working together. I don't want to go too much in detail. You can ask or read it in the book. And um, yes, and the coordination represents a commune in the next level, and this level has also coordination and so on. It goes to uh, until the Rojava level. In the beginning, there was, there was not a division between the, uh, the cantons, however. Okay, this area, they include everything. Uh, maybe you will not see everything. Defense, uh, YPG is connected to here and YPG. And you see uh, the women have a special autonomous role in all these structures. And they have a, they, for example, they elect the co female co-chair alone, not together with the men. And they have, the, they have a, their own peace and justice committees uh, which uh, in the justice system uh, for the cases which affect the women. Um, so this is a structure which existed. Then came the democratic autonomous structures and this legislative and executive council have been uh, created. As I said, I explained, tried to explain the reasons, but uh, these structures continue to exist. And they never gave up, said, okay, now we have government and parliament, so we will make elections and everything is good. No, the communes, the number of communes increased. And that, in 2014, beginning, now we have 2,500. At that time, we had less than 1,000. Communes are important for, as I said, for the empowering of people. Um, that continued, and this, all this, uh, the help, of course, uh, the, diff, uh, the this, this aid commission exists on each of this level, and they are, have been integrated into the ministries, more or less, and other actors which are not here can join it. What's interesting, only one point, I will not speak too much about it, is that each ministry of these 22 ministries has something like an assembly or council, and Tevdem is represented there for, with 40%, I believe, and other actors. Let's say, take the uh, Ministry for Agriculture. They have this assembly, and the farmers elect uh, representatives to this assembly, and this assembly takes the main decision, and the minister alone cannot take decision. It's a combination. So um, many people have, uh, have criticized, say, why we have all these structures uh, as we had this. Uh, but as I said, to include, involve more people, it's important. And the result is that um, we, if you look today, that these structures continue. Uh, it's, a, of course, a kind of compromise. We made some concessions. But uh, we should not too look too much only on the formal things. Uh, the power of the people, how they organize and fight and or, uh, the, uh, set up more cooperatives and the spreading of the communes also outside of Rojava to the liberated areas is going on. And this is the interesting part of it. Uh, the new structure, uh, the the Democratic Autonomous uh, Administration, the uh, ENKS didn't join, and PDK, yes, five minutes, okay, PDK uh, from Iraq, I mean, the Kurdistan regional government there, but especially the PDK from Barzani, they started with almost an embargo against it because the right, his parties, which are close to him, have, have not joined it and have more or less and less power. 
and uh, yes, and the developing of this political model as a third alternative to Syria. So uh, here you see the borders of uh, the administrations and the cantons, the three. Here are the borders. As you see, the liberated areas are a little more. And then each liberated area doesn't, is not uh, included automatically to the canton system. Uh, it depends on the people there to where they want to belong or uh, how they want to act. Uh, it's a process of discussion. So this is a very interesting and wonderful picture. It's uh, this legislative council of the Jizira Canton when people take decisions on the women's rights. As you see, um, you see it's, there are people from the grounds, the parties, organizations, they have brought them, sent them to their, um, also to the parliament. Uh, they are also connected, important part, to have them to different social movements and so on. Um, the, about the women movement, I don't want to say so much. Uh, I mentioned the separates peace and justice counts, uh, committees, which are important. The number of, yes, and here you see a picture from a meeting in the street in Derrick when we were there. Um, this, is, uh, this is Anja Flach here. You see her joining this meeting. And here you see that the women are even autonomously organized in the youth movement. They have their own uh, meetings and structures. The women have mostly more meetings than the men, but they need it. It's uh, as described also in the documentary. Um, this uh, here I show the Academy for Language Literature, which we could visit for a whole day. Uh, they have started with the Kurdish lessons in the schools, then they started to, in, uh, to give the uh, lessons, different lessons also in Kurdish. And it was the second step, which was last year. Now they are this uh, university in the Jizira Canton has just started, the Mesopotamian University. They used the you know, word university. Maybe they have discussed whether to mention different, but they use now the university. Um, but here I have to mention that in, even the Syriacs or the Turkmens or the Cherkis, they have started to give lessons in their languages, they, which they didn't do in the school. And here's a lesson for the people. Here you see a picture from one of the many women academies. Uh, the women, uh, there are a lot in the uh, I don't know how many, at least five, six, and the number of academies grows. There's now also an academy for ecology, which uh, two years ago didn't exist, but we have it also now, which I want to visit. Here are the young people doing meetings. Uh, we just was more by accident when we met them, around 50 or 60 years old. And here we visited the uh, hospitals, I make very fast. What's here important is, I said the health system is not, was not directly part of the MGRK system because they, in 2012 they created health councils and more than 90% of the medical doctors, nurseries and all the personnel joined it. The people with different political and cultural or backgrounds because Health is so important. I take this strategic decision. Tevdem didn't try to say it should be part of us. And it's free, uh, this health service. If you can, you pay a little. If you are very poor, you don't pay. And it's the justice system. We did, we did it, uh, people working on justice. Interesting there, thing is how the peace and justice uh, committees on the ground, which are connected or part of the communes or the neighborhood councils for conflict resolution as much as possible. Now there's a um, let's say project with the justice platforms, which are a broader uh, thing, which includes some hundred people. Here is a church in Derrick, which visited, and they, are, they didn't join the even not the democratic autonomous structure, they were more in the middle, 
Uh, they had even a picture of Assad, but they cannot normally act in Rojava. And here, the, the Syriacs, they have started to establish in their neighborhood their own security forces, and they work closely with the Asaish. And you must consider that the Syriacs, they have also been faced with a genocide in 2,900 years ago, like the Armenians, and there, were, it's, there are still, but less, let's say, prejudice or tensions with the Kurds. With this process, they are also coming together. So, pictures from uh, cooperatives. I don't have much, but it's one textile that's a bigger one, and where go many international activists and delegations. It's a textile. Here's a bakery, and now we have bakeries everywhere. We have on milk products, on vegetables, on different areas of production, but also on distribution, uh, of services, they are growing, and uh, there are hundreds of cooperatives now. And they are becoming slowly but more dominant in the economy. It's not a niche, it's important. Here's a picture of the Asaish in Heseke. Heseke is more in the south, and it was at that time divided, and a very tense city of tension. And I read today that there were, again, some small clashes, but I don't know which between whom. These three young Asage women, they came with us to some places in, uh, in the city of Amude. Here are YPG commanders, which we could visit. And this is an important strategic position. A uh, hill at the border of Turkey, it was important for two years. And here are some more pictures. And so I'm coming to the ends, really ends. Uh, three, three things I want to say. First, I do, we should not idealize what's going on in Rojava. It's a revolution. There are uh, forts, really big steps, and they make a lot of progress. And uh, with our conception and head, we may cannot sometimes understand it until we go there and see that some things can work. And, but there are also a lot of problems, of course, uh, challenges, and uh, many young, still, yeah, some, many young people leave the area, economic problems, and so on, or other problems. Um, Rojava is an area which is uh, in the Middle East, the most progressive, most democratic, I would say, uh, just beside the territory controlled by the Islamic State, the most, let's say, uh, repressive uh, structure in the Middle East, the most fascist one. So the two extremes, contrahands, are existing uh, beside themselves, and the reactionary forces of Middle East support directly, indirectly, Islamic State. And, but Rojava is a hope for, uh, for a political solution or more justice, peace uh, in Syria, because we have the two big blocks, the main jihadist dominated and the Syrian regime. And uh, yes, I would describe the challenges like this and come to the end of my speech. Thank you for listening.